Welcome to an episode of the Anafikita Podcast. Our special guest is Professor Marsha Inhorn, Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs and author of The Arab World Silent Reproductive Revolution. In addition to many other books that we will discuss today, it is a thrill to have you, Marsha, with us. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you, Mikey. Thank you for inviting me. So I kind of want to start with um, just first principles. Um, for somebody who doesn't know anything about the field, what does it mean to be a professor of anthropology and international affairs and the chair of the Council on Middle Eastern Studies at the same time? Uh, and how do those three things inter, uh, intersect? Um, because I would imagine a lot of people think I'm either a professor of international affairs or I'm a professor of anthropology or I'm a professor of Middle Eastern Studies in what ways can those three things coexist and sort of overlap um, in your work? That is a really interesting question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I'm an anthropologist. That's my disciplinary training. And actually, I'm a medical anthropologist, which is a huge subfield within anthropology that we'll probably be talking about today because I work on sort of contemporary health issues, reproductive health issues um, in the world. Uh, that's my specialty. But I'm trained as a sociocultural anthropologist, and I would say that most anthropologists, especially you know, in the past, I'm going to say, um, worked outside of the domestic. You know, uh, we anthropologists tend to work overseas and make a real commitment to learning a language. You know, understanding a place outside of their home country. So, anthropology, I think, of the social sciences, of the five social sciences, anthropology is the most global. Uh, and, you know, that's a commitment of our field, although it's changing. I'm going to say many more anthropologists are working, for example, in the United States. But sociology has typically been the discipline that works at home. Anthropology has typically been the discipline that works, you know, in the international sphere. And I ended up years ago in graduate school at Berkeley, making the commitment to, you know, work in the Middle Eastern region. And I actually started out in Egypt on a project. I was invited to be part of a sort of multidisciplinary project in Egypt on the blinding eye disease uh, called trachoma. So that's where I started working in a, you know, small Egyptian village with another medical anthropologist and and yeah, and so it started there, you know, and the commitment was made. And for my whole career, basically until the last decade or so, all of my research, all of the major projects that I have done have been on reproductive health in the Middle Eastern region. So when I came to, um, and, you know, I, I'm going to say at every university that I've you know been part of, I've been deeply involved in the Middle East studies world um, and, you know, starting in graduate school. And uh, at Michigan, University of Michigan, where I was before I came to Yale, I was very involved in the what they call the Center for Middle East and North African Studies. And I was the chair of that center. Uh, and so when I came to Yale, uh, I was asked to be the chair of what we call the Council on Middle East Studies. And I've been doing that um, sort of two periods of that. And so when they named me as a professor at Yale, it was more than anthropology it's also what they decided to call international affairs um, simply because, yeah, my work is international and I work on issues that are global, uh, all sorts of, you know, issues that have come up throughout my career about, uh, you know, reproductive health, about war and its effects on health, um, about how Islam has been, uh, you know, influenced certain health uh, parameters in the region. So, yeah, that's how I got to be a professor of anthropology and international affairs. And I am, you know, still currently the chair on the Council on Middle East Studies, which is very vibrant. I will say in the United States, there are these centers uh, that really focus faculty who work in a particular area of the world. And so we have a pretty vibrant, uh, I will say, Middle East Studies community here at Yale, which I very much enjoy being part of. That's amazing. Um, okay, so I wanna jump right into this idea of, um, infertility um because that's been a huge part of your a huge part of your work um somebody who tunes into africa and is super would be super engaged with our work is used to attending talks about sudanese rap and iraqi modernism and um you know 
the the building of the Suez Canal. And very, very seldom are we able to talk about the body and medicine and science yeah. and how all of those things and health and how all those things shape culture and shape history. Um, so if you would, if you were to try to explain it to, you know, a 15 year old high schooler um, who asks you, wait, wait a second, you're doing work on infertility uh, in vitro. Like, what are these things? Mm -hmm. And why did you start studying those things? Um, how would you explain it to a high schooler? Yeah. Um, health is really important just in general. And it is unfortunate that we don't have more scholarship on the health issues facing the Middle Eastern region. And so um, when I first went to graduate school, I was interested in problems that cause what we call stigma and human suffering, which are very important in the field of medical anthropology. And I quickly learned in, in Egypt, actually, which is where I started my career, that for married couples who were not able to have children, it was a source of profound suffering for, you know, for the couple and particularly women, which is, you know, sort of where I started talking about infertility among women. Infertility is a major, although underappreciated global reproductive health issue in any given society at least 10% of married couples are going to face a reproductive, an infertility problem at some point in their reproductive lives. And the percentages are higher in the Middle Eastern region and including male infertility, which really very few people think about or talk about, but um, uh, more than half of all cases of childlessness um, involve a so-called male infertility factor. And so, you know, in countries like Egypt, in Iran, there are pretty significant problems with infertility, um, the inability to have a child. Um, and, and it causes a lot of suffering because I'm going to argue um, that, you know, culturally, there's a bit of a kind of a cultural mandate once people do marry, heterosexual couples do marry to become parents, you know, within a certain amount of time. And people, generally speaking, really love children, desire children. It's considered to be an important part of family life. And so not being able to have children when people around you expect it, your mother-in-law, your parents, your friends, it's, it's a huge social burden, especially for women. And, you know, the interesting, really interesting thing about the Middle East, which we could call the silent revolution, you know, per the title of this, is that the Middle Eastern region early on uh, recognized the importance of these new assisted reproductive technologies to overcome the infertility problem. And that began with the invention of in vitro fertilization or IVF, what's popularly known as test tube baby making. It started in 1978 with the first baby born in England. And by 1980, there was already a fatwa or a you know authoritative decree coming out of Al Azhar University in Egypt saying IVF would be a good thing for Muslim couples to use to overcome infertility problems. And you know, really the IVF sector in the Middle Eastern region just took off in the 1980s. And by the 1990s, I mean there were IVF clinics in most Middle Eastern countries. And as a region of the world, uh, the Middle East has one of the most robust, and I'm going to say very high quality IVF sectors. It's a huge medical sector, including in countries like Lebanon. Um, so is, yeah. Can I ask you just a clarifying question? Yeah. Is it a very effective solution that is addressing a distinct problem in the Middle East? And if so, is there a reason that you've sort of you and your colleagues in the field have sort of cornered and figured out, oh, this is probably why there is so much infertility across the Arab world or the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, there are certain causes of infertility in, in men and women, and there are a couple of problems that women can face, um, one being so-called tubal infertility from infections that occur. And there's another problem, a growing global problem called polycystic ovary syndrome, which is genetically based, but involves diet and, um, you know, it's a gene environment interaction. So there are a lot of infertile women in the Middle Eastern region, but the real sort of, again, the secret problem in the Middle Eastern region is male factor infertility. Again, a lot of it is genetically based. Um, and 
Um, also, you know, just uh, lifestyle issues, especially male smoking. So many men in the region smoke and smoking is never good for male reproductive health. And there are probably other environmental factors too, just air pollution in some of the big cities in the region. Um, so there are high rates of male factor infertility, which just there, and that, what is that? It means low sperm count, poor movement of the sperm, deformed shape of sperm, and some men produce no sperm at all. And those uh, issues are more prevalent among Middle Eastern men than they are, say, among men in the United States. And so when I worked in Lebanon, for example, in um, several IVF clinics, the physicians there said, you know, we have really high rates of male infertility here, severe male factor infertility that you would not see uh, in the U.S. where we did our training. So that's interesting. And, and that needs to be addressed. And in the what is just to yeah, uh, put a point on that, what is high? Uh, well, uh, in the U.S. or in the world, about 50 percent of infertility cases involve a so-called male factor and it's often said, you know, that, uh, you know, some percentage are equal percentages of, 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 of infertile couples will be female or male factor infertility. But in the, you know, in the Middle Eastern region, it's higher. It's, you know, well over 50% of cases involve a male factor. Um, so like in the work that I did, it was, you know, more than 60% of cases involved a male factor. And I first learned this about the sort of uh, high prevalence of male factor infertility. In the first study I did in Egypt of the introduction of in vitro fertilization to Egypt, I went there hoping to study women who were the first users of IVF in Egypt. And what I discovered is that there were husbands in, you know, in the hospital rooms with their wives and something like 70, more than 70% of those cases involved men who had male factor infertility and wanted to talk to me about their problem. They felt deeply bad. <laughs> they felt, uh, you know, sad that their male infertility problem was affecting their wives so much because in in vitro fertilization, it's really the wife's body <laughs> that has to go through all of the sort of serious medical procedures. And even other, when it's male factor, even when it's male factor, you know, and so men, what do they have to do? They have to basically ejaculate sperm into a cup so that it can be used yeah. in the procedure. If they have no sperm in the ejaculate, then they have to go into the body, into the testicles and withdraw sperm painfully. But I think the really interesting and important thing about why male infertility in the Middle Eastern region is really important and difficult to some extent is not only because there are, you know, some severe male factor issues at play, but uh, the whole notion of sperm donation, which is what in the West might be offered to a couple where there's severe male factor infertility, that is really not accepted by most men in the Middle Eastern region. And it's actually considered to be haram or religiously forbidden for um, most Muslim men, although not necessarily Shia Muslim men, which is another interesting uh, issue. But mm -hmm. men, you know, men don't want to use another man's sperm to make a baby. I mean, I wrote an article called He Won't Be My Son, just the idea of taking somebody else's sperm, you know, another lineage, another man, another patrilineage, another father to make a, a child just doesn't really resonate. And so that's not an option. And the final thing I'll say, and then, you know, I'll be yeah. quiet is that, so there's a variant of in vitro fertilization called intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. And that technology was developed in Belgium in the nineties, specifically to overcome these problems of severe male factor infertility basically finding any viable spermatozoan and injecting it directly into the human egg to sort of force fertilization to occur. And ICSI has been, I'm going to argue, a rather revolutionary technology mm -hmm. for inf male infertility. And when it arrived in the Middle East, it arrived, you know, in the early, I'll say about 1994, 1995, it came to, to the Middle East. And it is, it, it, caused a kind of coming out of all of these male infertility cases. Um, you know, the realization that there actually is a technology that could help men overcome, you know, their, 
their infertility. Um, clinics advertised it. Clinics were overcrowded with, you know, cases of male infertility, and they still are. Interesting. So, you know, it's important. ICSI, it's called ICSI. No one talks about this technology called ICSI, but it's really important. And it's really, really important in the Middle East, especially for Muslim men who are not going to accept sperm donation. Are there, I mean, if we look sort of internationally and transnationally, are there other regions that culturally have approached, you know, IVF, um, in a different way that, you know, uh, would be distinct, you know, I, that if, maybe you would say, you know, in Scandinavia, they, this is how the, the, the society responds to it in Southeast Asia. This is how the society responds to it in Central Africa. This is how they respond to it. Um, are there noteworthy examples that illustrate the cultural differences, um, in a way that I, I might be able to appreciate yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm just going to say on a most basic level, um, accessing these technologies really differs from one part of the world to the next. They're very expensive. And to answer a question that you posed earlier, they don't always work. I mean, success rates for these technologies are less than 50%. And so people have to keep trying them often multiple times to get a successful outcome. And it's really expensive. And if you, there's no medical insurance or you know state subsidization of these technologies, you know, a lot of people just can never begin to access them. And that's a huge issue. And the area of the world that has the least access to these technologies is sub-Saharan Africa. You know, many, many, many countries uh, for many years didn't have a single IVF clinic in them. That's changing now. There's been a sort of, you know, rapid growth of an IVF sector in sub-Saharan Africa. But that's why, again, the Middle Eastern region, going from Morocco all the way over to Iran, you know, and the Gulf, they were very early in developing IVF clinics, very, very early. By 1986, the first three clinics opened in Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Um, and most regions of the world, when the technologies arrive, infertile people have rushed to them. I mean, it's often the only way that they will be able to bear a biogenetically related child. But yes, there are really interesting cultural differences and for the Middle Eastern region, uh, the most interesting sort of counter example is Iran, the country of Iran, uh, which is, you know, the demographic epicenter of Shia Islam. And early on, the um, religious authorities there, uh, d you know, talked about what's allowed, what's not allowed, and they were more permissive uh, in accepting what we called we call third party reproductive assistance, which is the use of donor egg, donor sperm, um, donor embryo, and surrogacy. So Iran is the only country in the Middle Eastern region, and we might argue in the whole Muslim world, where all of those third party reproductive technologies are actually available. And that was because of permission and actual fatwas that were issued saying that these things are acceptable. Um, actually, Ayatollah Khamenei issued a very famous fatwa in, I believe, the year 1999, saying that uh, these technologies are important to overcome the marital and psychological issues that might arise if a couple was unable to have children. Mm. It was, in a way, almost like a feminist argument. We need to do this for marriage and psychology to protect you know, the marriage. Um, so, yeah, so Iran is a place where uh, we could say everything goes, and that makes it, interestingly, very close to Israel, <laughs> which yeah. is uh, the capital of all of these technologies. Israel has the highest per capita usage of all of these assisted reproductive technologies of any country in the world, state subsidized, you know. Wow. So, interesting kind of parallel going on. Yeah. There. Yeah. You know, um, for those who can't see the screen, I'm, I've sort of cycled through a couple of the books that you uh, have written, and a lot of them have to do, obviously, with gender. Um, I'm curious how um, the intersectionality behind how these technologies are have been treated historically um, when, I don't know, I'll just say it as crudely as it comes to my mind, when people think that the problem is a female problem, when people think the problem is a male problem. Um, and 
when we superimpose onto that uh, class and uh, income, um, I'd be curious if you have any stories or an anecdotes or um, wisdom <laughs> over the course of the your uh, your time studying this that would help illustrate how that actually um, unfolds. Yeah, the gender dimensions are just hugely important. So thank you for asking about that too. Yeah, in my earliest um, study of infertility, it was in Egypt in a public maternity hospital, really serving the poor, Egyptian urban poor people. And it was also the first public maternity hospital in that country to offer an IVF uh, program. And so I was there. And again, you know, people flooding into this infertility clinic, hoping to make a test tube baby. Uh, and the interesting thing thing was for me, you know, the assumption is there is an, a, a stereotype that if a couple is infertile, a Muslim man will always divorce his wife, that he can move on and he will not stay with her. And what I was finding in, you know, well over a hundred interviews that I did with, uh, you know, Egyptian poor urban Egyptian women who were not educated, who often didn't work and were very reliant on their husbands for income their husbands were financing their quest for conception and were being very kind and supportive to them. And I kept hearing story after story about, you know, how much I love my husband, how much he loves me. He'll never replace me. And uh, I would say, well, you know, why do you think that is? And women would say, well, I, I'm the 1% lucky one, you know, 99 other percent other women in my situation who are infertile, their husbands will leave them. And then I would get the next one. I am so lucky. I got one of the good ones. So I thought this is very interesting. There are a lot of 1% Egyptian husbands, you know, I ended up writing a chapter in one of my books, um, what about what I call conjugal connectivity. And I use the term connectivity I drew from a very famous uh, Lebanese American anthropologist named Saad Joseph, who's written about the Lebanese family. And she had coined this term called patriarchal connectivity, that even in situations where there's patriarchy and you have senior males sort of in charge of the family, there's a lot of love and connectivity in family life in the Arab world. People deeply care about each other. They're very enmeshed in each other's lives. And so boundaries between self and other are very blurry. People feel deeply uh, connected. And she called this connectivity. And so I wrote, wrote a story about conjugal connectivity, husbands and wives who were deeply, deeply in love with each other and were just bound to each other, even though they were childless and were suffering over their childlessness, but they were not going to give each other up. And I found it in both directions, when the woman was infertile or when the husband was infertile. And I thought, this is a very interesting thing. And over the years, I mean, I could tell you, I've seen that over and over in different settings. You know, I've worked in a multiple Middle Eastern countries. I worked in Lebanon and I worked in the United Arab Emirates. And in Lebanon, I was there specifically to study the introduction of ICSI, this remarkable technology for male infertility. And again, I found, you know, women who were devoted to their infertile husbands and men who were devoted to their infertile wives. There was a lot of hub, love, you know, in the air. I actually wrote, you know, I said, love is in the air because, uh, and, and my argument is, if you didn't have married couples, you have to be married to access these technologies. It's very heterosexist, heteronormative family structure. But if you didn't have heterosexual couples, married couples who love each other and are committed to each other, there would not be this gigantic IVF sector in the Middle Eastern region because people wouldn't be trying those technologies together. They would just be breaking up and you know moving on. And so I really think that that's important that, you know, there is commitment, marital commitment, which is never assumed. I mean, even stereotypes in the region assume that a man whose wife is infertile, that he'll abandon her, he'll divorce her. And I yeah. found that not to be the case. And so I've written a lot about, you know, sort of the gender effects of having these technologies. The very fact that they exist also makes people feel hopeful um, and, you know, there's again, and this is where Islam comes into, uh, you know, play, because there are these sayings that, you know, if you have if you're suffering from a problem, you should search as far as China to find a solution. Um, you know, you shouldn't give up. I've actually argued that Islam is 
techno scientifically agentive. You know, there's a lot of belief that science and technology are here because of God, right? And therefore, you should use them. And doctors are like the 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 handmaidens, if you will, of of yeah. things that come into the world. So there's a you know the gender dimension is a really important part of the story that you know that these technologies can sort of help people. And for men, I found that the very existence of a technology to overcome male infertility really relieved men's sense of diminished manhood. (laughs) You know, this isn't about me as a man. This isn't about my masculinity. This is a medical problem, just like any other medical problem. And now there's a medical solution to a problem and I need to use it. So in medical anthropology, we call this the medicalization of a health issue. But in this case, it really had a sort of positive effect on people's sense of identity. Like, you know, this is like diabetes or heart disease. It's a yeah. medical condition. I wasn't, I didn't do anything to bring it upon myself. And now I have a technology to help me overcome the problem. Do we have a sense of if this is a contemporary problem? Um, like, do we have any records on if 100 years ago or 150 years ago, there were similar amounts of incidents of this? Um, or is or is this a relatively new phenomenon and the solution has sort of stepped up to match the problem? Yeah, well, that's really interesting. I mean, it, the inability to have children has been around for millennia, probably since human existence. And I can say the interesting part of that for me was working in Egypt with poor women who were simultaneously drawing upon biomedical, you know, Western medical or biomedical technologies and, you know, and therapies, and then had a huge world that I called ethnogynecology of these, you know, traditional remedies and things that they were doing. And many of those those um, remedies, those, you know, treatments, those traditional remedies went back hundreds, you know, millennia, um, (laughs) actually back to the pharaonic period. And there was actually a person who did her PhD at the University of Chicago who used my book and went backwards to the pharaonic period and could actually show that some of the contemporary ethnomedical treatments literally dated from the pharaonic period. So obviously people have been trying to solve infertility problems for a very, very long time. But I am going to say that for infertility, the, the, the boom period of sort of understanding or dealing with it has been since IVF came into existence, you know, now yeah. almost more than 40 years ago everything changed after that. And, you know, the, the Middle Eastern world is part of this huge boom yeah. of assisted reproduction. I want to talk a little bit about um, the book that we have on the screen, um, Cosmopolitan Conceptions, IVF Sojourns in Global Dubai. Um And I'll read from, I think from the, basically the back cover where it says the book highlights the stories of 220 repro travelers or repro travelers from 50 countries who sought treatment at a cosmopolitan IVF clinic in Dubai. These couples cannot find safe, affordable, legal, and effective IVF services in their home countries. So that leads me to ask which countries are these in, you know, in the 21st century where people with the means to travel to uh, Dubai could still not find, you know, safe, affordable, legal, and effective IVF treatments. Um, and are they in the are they in the region, or are they sort of um, in other neighboring regions? Yeah, uh, an excellent question. Uh, believe it or not, the travel comes in all directions. Uh, it is global north to global south. It's global south, global south. And so just examples, um, in terms of legality, um, Europe, you know, the, the nations of Europe are what some scholars have described as a legal mosaic or a legal patchwork in terms of assisted reproduction. There are different laws really from country to country. And some countries are very uh, restrictive and some are very permissive. Um, and there are things that you just simply can't do in some European countries. And so I found couples from Europe um, coming to the UAE because they could actually do things in the UAE that they couldn't do in 
their home countries, especially for men with male infertility problems, interestingly. But also I had a section of that book on what I called uh, the, the NHS refugees, uh, people fleeing from England and the subsidized healthcare system in England called the National Health Service to the UAE because there, there is state subsidization of IVF in England, but it's on a lottery system. It's literally on a what's called a postcode lottery. And so if you're in an area that has a very strict lottery system, you may wait literally years to get access to IVF. And in infertility, you really can't wait that long because age is a factor in infertility. You know, your time runs out. So there were couples coming from the UK who had really been like... Uh, outlaw or the, you know, restricted from getting access to, to IVF in the NHS service and were coming. So there were people from Europe flowing into the UAE. Um, there were people from sub-Saharan Africa, because as I noted, it's the one region of the world that still just doesn't have a well-developed IVF sector, although that is changing. And then, you know, the UAE is full of people from South Asia. It's honestly, there are many more South Asians living in the UAE than there are actually local Emiratis. And there was a huge flow back and forth from parts of, of South Asia, both India and Pakistan. You know, Pakistan, at the time I was doing my study, did not have a well-developed IVF sector. India has a booming IVF sector, but a lot of... Uh, Couples felt that they were not getting safe and effective IVF care there because it was almost like an assembly line and they didn't like the quality of care. So there are reasons why people repro travel. It's for you know legal reasons, economic reasons, safety reasons, um, and also privacy reasons. I found interestingly, Emirati couples who were secretly traveling across Emirates to do IVF in a different Emirate because they didn't want anybody in their home Emirate to know that they were doing IVF. Mm, interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, so there were just people coming literally from, I met people literally from 50 different countries who had managed to make their way to this one clinic. Um, and it was a booming multicultural clinic. I called it a medically cosmopolitan clinic because they figured out we need to be patient-centered toward people coming from so many different regions of the world. It's like Emirates Airlines, basically. Like. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's like yeah. we need to serve the world. So we need people who speak Swahili, you know, Urdu, Arabic. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. So um, do you feel like your work, um, and it is, the answer is, it is what I'm about to say, but do you feel like your work is designed to be focus on contributing to broader policy debates around reproductive health and gender? Um, or are you not even concerned with policy personally? And if people use it for policy, they do, but you yourself aren't advocating any specific policy uh, decisions. Yeah, I, I am. I have also a degree in public health and I yeah. care deeply about reproductive health issues as global public health issues. And so you know, I have to say my largest article in terms of citations is called Infertility Around the Globe. Um, and it's about, I, I can't remember the subtitle, but we talk about gender, you know, the prevalence of infertility and what needs to be done to prevent infertility from happening in the first place. Because some, some infertility is very preventable. And I actually wish a lot of men in the world, more than 50% of the world's men smoke cigarettes. And I wish that there was a lot done to reduce male smoking. Um, and, and other things like their reproductive tract infections, we should be doing a lot to prevent preventable forms of infertility. But a lot of infertility is not preventable. You know, people didn't cause it, bring it upon themselves. And so we need to uh, have ways that people have more access to these technologies. And that's been a sort of a huge uh, part of what I've been writing about. And I've been a bit involved in what's been called uh, the low cost IVF movement to try to get really inexpensive, accessible IVF services to people in different parts of the world. The focus has been heavily on um, sub-Saharan Africa, but you know that's true also in parts of the Middle East where yeah. we need more affordable, more accessible IVF. And yeah, I mean, I do, I consider infertility to be a really important uh, reproductive justice issue because the definition of reproductive justice um, that was really coined by a, 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 a feminist organization here of women of color, you know, feminists of color, um, their definition of reproductive justice is 
the ability to have children, the ability not to have children, and the ability to parent children in safe environments. And infertil infertility is about the ability to have children. You know, if you want to have children, how can you do that? How can you be helped to have children? And, you know, I think that, you know, the, the Declaration of Human Rights also said that people should have the right to found a family if they want to. And so infertility for me is about the prevention of that basic human right, that basic form of reproductive justice. And I care a lot about it. So I have been involved in some activist efforts. Uh, they haven't gone far enough, um, but, but yeah, there are efforts out there to try to address some of these, you know, issues, especially of access of poor, people's poor access to, to these kinds of technologies. In the Arab world is the biggest sort of um, detriment to progress on these fronts related to funding and sort of capital, or are there, um, you know, uh, philosophical, religious, ethical, um, pushbacks as well uh, on other people's perspectives. Yeah, I'm going to say that for me, the saddest part of, of the problems in the region um, are our war, you know, war war and the effects, the afterlives of war. I mean, some countries, as we know, have gone through just horrible conflicts, including ones, uh, you know, started by the U.S. in the country of Iraq, for example. So some countries that did have um, services for infertility, really good services, you know, they were destroyed. I mean, and that is that is a shame. Okay, so there's that issue, which we could talk about. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the cost of doing IVF in the region in general is lower, much lower than say in the United States, but it's still prohibitive for a lot of couples. I mean, to do these technologies, it's, we're talking thousands of dollars. Um, in the UAE, for example, the time I was doing my study there, it was about five to 6,000 US dollars to do one cycle of IVF. And that's prohibitive for a lot of couples. Um, so, you know, access is an issue. And the best example of why access is an issue but can be overcome is the country of Turkey. Um, you know, Turkey, let's just say that Erdogan, uh, the leader of Turkey, is pronatalist in his rhetoric and wants all Turks to have at least three children. And because of that sort of discourse, uh, the country has made the um, decision that IVF cycles should be funded by the National Health Insurance Plan in Turkey. And once that decision was made, um, it was it just caused a boom in couples seeking IVF services all over the country. The number of clinics went in a very short period of time from something like 50 or 60 clinics to well over, I believe, 150 clinics. And so, um, you know, massive expansion of the IVF sector in the country of Turkey. And my dear colleague, Zeynep Gürten, who's worked in Turkey, has really argued that that a sort of state commitment to providing IVF services that are state subsidized by the health insurance plan has really made these technologies accessible to marginalized populations, including rural populations who would never have had the chance to overcome their infertility problems. And so that's a very interesting example of where a government policy decision really you know, improved access uh, for people. And there are some countries in the Middle Eastern region that do offer some uh, public clinics, public IVF clinics, but in general, they're few and far between. It's mostly a private industry, and therefore there are always gonna be problems for people who just don't have the means, the financial yeah. means to access the technologies. I'm curious about sort of um, migrant populations and refugee populations. Um, you know, you mentioned the 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 number of uh, war and con wars and conflicts in the region that have left millions and millions uh, forced to leave their their um, their homes and communities. Um, I'm curious about the sort of views on um, you know fertility fertility issues in those communities. Like, let, let's say you take, um, you know, uh, Lebanese, Iraqi, Palestinian, Syrians who are in North America and have been in North America for a hundred years, um, anywhere between one to a hundred years. Do you see s similar responses to it? Different, uh, different feelings about um, if uh, different willingness to, to be engaged with these types of uh, treatments? 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, the last book that I published that has to do with the Middle East and America, if you will, uh, it's called America's Arab Refugees, Vulnerability and Health on the Margins. And that was a book that came out of a long study, a five-year study in an IVF clinic serving the Arab uh, community, the Arab American community in, in Michigan. There's a huge you know, ethnic enclave community of people from the Arab world in um, the Detroit area. And so I worked there, actually after coming back from Lebanon, I worked for five years going back and forth to a clinic there. And what I discovered is that many, really most of the couples that I was seeing there had fled war actually from two countries. It was from Lebanon. It was actually a lot of Lebanese, mostly Shia Muslim Lebanese couples who had left at some point during the long conflict between 1975 and 2000, you know, because Israel still occupied Southern Lebanon until the year 2000. So they had come during the long war. And then there were Iraqis, uh, Iraqi refugees who had come during the first Gulf War. Um, You know, they had left, they'd fled in the 1990s, often from Saudi Arabia, where they'd spent time in refugee camps in Saudi Arabia. And then beginning in about 2007, the huge influx of Iraqi refugees from the 2003 American war in Iraq started coming in. And so I ended up working with a lot of people who had fled war. And it was very sad because, you know, I mean, people felt like, you know, I left because I had to, I was forced out of my country. And especially for Iraqis, I must say, um, you know, prior to the war wars in Iraq, The medical system in Iraq was highly functioning. They were very proud of their educational and medical system. And there were functioning IVF units in Iraq. Uh, And, you know, people, Iraqis often said, you know, we had a great medical system in our own country, but it's destroyed. My home is destroyed. I can't go back there. I called it reproductive exile. Like you can't go back to the home country, which has been destroyed by the US, my country. And now you're in the US where for these couples, being able to use IVF to overcome infertility was almost impossible because in the United States, it is such a high cost to do an IVF cycle. It's the most expensive place in the world to do IVF. It's rarely subsidized by insurance. And you know the average cycle is well over 12,000 US dollars. That's and the, crazy. Yeah, it's the US costs are more than three times the global average. It's just a very expensive place to do these things. And so these couples who are not doing well financially, a lot of these refugee couples, there was no way they would be able to access IVF. And it was exile. They were exiled by war from the, you know, Iraq or Lebanon. And then in the United States, I argued they were exiled from the reproductive health care system. You know, there was no way they were going to be able to access these technologies. And for refugees, you know, coming from a country where they can't go back and being in a place where they want to found a family and feel normative within their communities to not be able to do so is a tragedy. You know, I called it this feeling of exile being forced out and, And so, yes, there was willingness to use these services. I mean, people were coming, hoping to, you know, access these assisted reproductive technologies, but their chances were very low. Um, And I then the book is really a larger critique of especially the U.S. involvement in the wars in the Middle Eastern region, especially in Iraq. And, you know, it asks, what is the moral responsibility of the U.S.? Uh, to people whose countries and lives it's upended. Um, It's a pretty critical analysis of, you know, what the U.S. did (laughs) in the Middle Eastern region. And so, you know, now we have this huge Syrian refugee crisis, as you know. I mean, it is, is, to me, you know, I think the wars in the Middle East have been very devastating and, and ongoing legacies of those wars, right? So in a place like Syria, I mean, this is really hard to talk about, but um, you mentioned smoking. Um, Obviously, war, both, you know, exposed to the chemicals that are released during warfare and conflict. um, And and also just like the the fumes of destruction, destructed buildings. Um, 
do we see different incidences in um, fertility issues before and after these types of conflicts? Um, are, are, is there, are there any statistics on something like that? Yeah, actually, that was I, it was something I was curious about in Lebanon when I worked in Lebanon in the early yeah. 2000s. Uh, I had a colleague at the University of Michigan who was an expert in toxic metals. And so uh, Lebanese men were very kind and offered blood samples that were then analyzed at the University of Michigan for a variety of uh, a suite of heavy metals that shouldn't be in the human body. And the good news for Lebanese men in my study is that they they weren't showing elevated signs of, you know, some very bad things that shouldn't be in the human body. But the problem in Iraq is that the United States used toxic weapons of warfare that have very, very long-term effects. And the one that I wrote about in the book is called depleted uranium or DU. It is a radioactive heavy metal that uh, the U.S. used in uh, armaments, in bullets, missiles. Um, It's super strong, you know, tensile strength. And so it's an excellent, uh, excellent, you know, mechanism of war, uh, depleted uranium. And it's, it's been used in, it's been used for a while. It was used in the first Gulf War, and then it was used in the second one. Huge amounts of depleted uranium were fired, but also left in the environment. And so there's real concern that basically the U.S. war, uh, Basically, you know, the toxicity is high and and other forms like burn pits and all of these things that happen in war, the destruction of things. And so there has been ongoing research to look at the effects of using depleted uranium and other, you know, other metals and other, um, you know, chemicals and warfare in Iraq. And it is it is looking like there are going to be long term reproductive health effects in, in Iraq. Um, and actually, you know, the men from Iraq in my study talked about it. They said, you know, we know that there was all this depleted uranium that was used. And, you know, we think that we may be infertile because of what we, you know, breathed in during the time that we were there. And that very well could be. And there's been a lot of work in Fallujah in Iraq, which was heavily bombarded by the U S in the, you know, 2003 war and, you know, problems of congenital anomalies in babies, you know, genetic changes, just all sorts of reproductive, untoward reproductive health effects. So yes, warfare is not good for human health. Um, that is a really important message. It's, warfare is not good for reproductive health either. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you before we move on to the sort of uh, the rapid questions, what are you working on these days? Oh, well, thank you. Um, I shifted to uh, the topic of egg freezing, which is we could call the newest new reproductive technology. Of course. Uh, The ability they finally figured out in the last decade or so, or actually in the early 2000s, how to freeze human eggs, which they had not been able to do um, up until that point. And so there's been a rapid uh, development of egg freezing, not only for young women who have cancer, it's called medical egg freezing, but then women who feel like they're running out of reproductive time and want to sort of retain their potential to use their own eggs are now freezing their eggs electively. And so, um, yeah, I did a big study of that and I have a book coming out in 2023 called uh, Motherhood on Ice, The Mating Gap and Why Women Freeze their eggs. Um, and my part really focuses on the, uh, on the U S I had hoped to actually do a piece of that study in the UAE, but at the time I did my study, they hadn't really developed egg freezing services. So my book is going to be my first one that really focuses on American women. Interesting. Yeah. Women. I feel like this is, um, I mean, I personally know so many people who are doing it or uh, have thought about doing it. Um, and so I feel like that is such an important conversation to have. Um, yeah, can I, I also just, heard, say, yeah, can yeah, I just yeah. say something about that too? You know, it is for, I'm calling it the mating gap. Um, and I'm talking about just the, you know, women who are highly educated, who have not been able to find partners, um, partly because of huge educational disparities that seem to be growing around the world. 
But, you know, also in countries like Lebanon, you know, where there were demographic consequences to war over time, where, you know, young men were killed, fled, whatever, it's left these demographic disparities between the number of women in the population and the number of men in the population. And so that is a, a, a gap, you know, women who just couldn't find partners. And when you get to the point of your late 30s and you don't have a partner and you still want to be a mom and be pregnant and have a child, what are you going to do? You know, that's where women are turning to egg freezing if they have the means, because, you know, it's one way to sort of retain your reproductive potential if you if you the if you cannot find a partner for whatever reason yeah. and so that is the story of that book i heard there's also a um a recent sort of um i don't know if trend is the right word but i've seen this pop up a lot um around i don't know the right term terminology like like basically the it, the the mirror image but for men as well Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, there's a Lebanese uh, person who has, Lebanese yeah. American person who started a business about sperm freezing too. Yeah. Um, that, you know, you never know what's going to happen in the future. Your healthy sperm in your 20s, you know, why don't you freeze it? Um, yeah. And sperm freezing has been uh, available as a technology for a very long time. So it wasn't that it wasn't there. It's just mm. that nobody had thought about, you know, offering a service for people to do that. And so it's now available too. Um yeah. And egg freezing is, it's, you know, really been around only in the past decade. It, it started sort of being offered clinically in the late, uh, late in 2012 in the U S. And so, yeah, um, it's a huge, you know, uptick in it. And now the technology is basically spreading globally. I mean, yeah. it's available in the middle Eastern region now, but the issue for women who are not partnered um, and might consider doing this as single women is that it does involve transvaginal technologies. You know, you have to like be willing to have a scope put in your body. And so for women who are concerned about, um, you know, virginity, which is an issue for some women in the region, that is going to be something that holds people back. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it's, we'll see how it develops. I mean, it is being used definitely in places like Lebanon for young women with cancer, who, yeah. if they don't use the technology, if they don't freeze their eggs, they may be rendered infertile by the chemotherapeutic agents. And so that's really where the technology began was in the world of oncology, but now it's sort of brought into other uses. And it's going to be really interesting to see how it unfolds in the Middle Eastern region, just given sense, cultural sensitivities around women being single, virginity, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Okay, so I want to uh, jump to the quick questions and then uh, we'll wrap up. Okay. So what are you reading or watching these days? Me? <laughs> yeah, you. Oh, wow. Um, I, am, I have a, a dear friend who is from India who's uh, recommended a number of very interesting shows that I've been watching. I just finished one called Made in Heaven, um, which is very interesting dealing with, among other things, LGBTQ issues in, in India, cool. um, lives of elites. Um, what am I reading? I, I have to say, as an anthropologist, the books that we write are called ethnographies. We do field work. We call it ethnography and we write ethnographies. And I love reading ethnographies. I, I just read them for my classes. I read them because I enjoy them. And there are some incredible ethnographies coming out of the Middle Eastern region. Um, one that I think I would like to herald here um, is called Sacrificial Limbs. It's from uh, Turkey, my colleague at UCLA named Salah Jean Akishos. Uh, it was written about uh, what happens to young soldiers in Turkey, especially the long war against the Kurds in Turkey has left a lot of people with limb amputations. And he wrote a brilliant book called Sacrificial Limbs. Um, there are many others I could point to, but there's a rich world of ethnographic work coming out uh, about the Middle Eastern region. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time reading those kinds of books myself. Amazing. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Shadow for a day, past or present. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I, I could even think of a person that I'd love to shadow for a day. Um, I feel like you're working, you're kind of in the business of shadowing people. <laughs> 
Well, I shadow. Yeah. I talk to people in my work all of the time. Yeah. You know, one thing I just want to say, it was, a, I, I, I did love President Obama and Michelle Obama. Okay. So maybe I would like to shadow them. But one thing I was disappointed about two things, they had infertility problems and they used IVF to create their babies. And we didn't know about that until Michelle Obama published her book called Being. And President Obama here is responsible for what we call the Affordable Care Act, which is a brilliant you know, uh, way for people to get health insurance, also known as Obamacare. But there are no provisions for infertility treatment in Obamacare, and that disappoints me. Yeah. I, that's the first time I'm hearing this. Interesting. Yeah. So though I would love to shadow them. Uh, well, maybe I- shadow them the day that they were... <laughs> <laughs> doing their IVF treatments, right? <laughs> or the day that they were uh, pushing pushing Obamacare through. Yeah, right. <laughs> you could remind them. Um, what do you think most people misunderstand about your work? Uh, the main misunderstanding from the very beginning when I started working on infertility in the Middle Eastern region is why would you study infertility in that region of the world that is so overpopulated? We need more infertile people in the Middle Eastern region. I have literally been told that by people in the region and by people in the U.S., including one member of my dissertation committee who shall remain nameless, told me I had picked the most stupid topic to do my dissertation on because- You know, yeah, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the importance of infertility and the suffering it causes for people, not only women, but men too. And so I am so happy that I focused on this under misunderstood reproductive health condition. It's been with me my whole career. I spent my entire career studying that issue, the new technologies that have emerged to overcome different aspects of this and I've literally followed them through different parts of the Middle Eastern region. And because of that, I've been able to spend a lot of time in some incredible places, including Beirut, Lebanon, which was one of the best experiences of my life. So I feel that, you know, people need to realize that infertility matters and also for the region that there's an incredible medical infrastructure in the Middle Eastern region. It's a very high tech medical part of the world, places like Lebanon, Nobody would think of that, you know, oh, they have good medical care in a place like Lebanon. Well, yes, they do. (laughs) I think that's misunderstood outside of the region. I think that's very much misunderstood. The Middle East is seen as kind of a backwater, and that is just simply, simply wrong, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm going to change this question. Usually we ask you whose work do you admire or are inspired by, but I'm sure you have millions of colleagues or not millions, but, uh, you know, hundreds of colleagues who uh, inspire you and who you admire. I'm going to just change the question slightly. Where outside, where do you get your inspiration outside of your profession? Outside of your sort of the work itself, where do you, you know, muster up inspiration to keep on doing what you're doing or get new ideas? Uh, Well, I'm going to just have to say, for me, my inspiration is my family. (laughs) I have, you know, I have two children who are now in their 20s and a husband who has, they've been co-travelers with me in my long anthropological career. We've lived in several Middle Eastern countries together. And, you know, my children are very global and very appreciative of other parts of the world. And in my daily life, they are my inspiration, you know, they're, and during COVID, they came back, one came back from New York, one came back from Los Angeles, and we all live together very happily. So, I mean, honestly, they're, they're the other huge part of my life. I think, you know, Outside, I will say, honestly, in terms of inspiration for the work, I have really an incredible global network of colleagues who are, we will call them dear friend colleagues. I mean, honestly, I have very dear colleagues who do the same work that I do in Iran, in Turkey, in India, in Thailand, you know, in the UK, we we are part of a group and network. We see each other frequently. We have conferences together. We're doing a huge edited volume together. You know, they're my, they're my inspiration in my, my scholarly life. Um, So those are, those are the two, two things that really keep me going 
make me love my career. And I have to say, I, I never regretted becoming a medical anthropologist of the Middle Eastern region. For me, it was the best possible career and the best possible place to, to really, you know, situate my, my scholarly life. I love I, it. I loved every minute of it. Let's put it that way. So nice. Well, Marsha, thank you so much for, for chatting and for educating us. This has been really, really fun talking to you. Oh, it's been wonderful talking to you. You had great questions and I just appreciate being invited to do this yeah. talk.